welcome to another episode of the Truth About Real Estate Investing Show. My name is Robin Cito, and this past weekend we had our first real estate meetup back in person at the new office. Uh, for anyone who missed it, we had Cherry and I bought a new office. Uh, we're expanding; we're not replacing. It's actually the unit adjacent to our uh, existing office, so we have double the space now. Thankfully, restrictions are loosening. Uh, we were allowed to have more folks in, in in person. We will continue to do Zoom as long as I know some are more comfortable being virtual. I think face to face personally is the best way to learn and the best way to uh, connect and learn from other investors. So I'm personally excited to get back to being in person. Uh, some of the takeaways from the meetup were uh, regarding fake news and real estate. For example, uh, you see some of the media and politicians who are talking about 1 million plus vacant homes in Canada when Census Canada actually uses the term unoccupied homes, which means which includes also uh, unoccupied homes, like as no one lives there, and non-primary residences like cottages and student rentals. Therefore, Census Canada's definition of unoccupied includes cottages and student rentals versus politicians and media are including cottages and student rentals as being vacant homes. So they do what they do, politicians and media. And uh, personally, I'll keep looking out for and fact-checking media and politicians. <laughs> also, we had an update on where the mar- listed market is from the street view. For those who don't know, I myself am a realtor and I have five realtors on my team. We're all real estate investors ourselves. So we lived this just as much as everybody else. And the market's completely insane. It's a complete seller's market, the worst we've ever seen. But we are so thankfully some of our clients are sellers. So they're doing fantastic. But we are finally seeing more listings coming on the market. So we're seeing a little bit more balance, but that doesn't mean we're not going to see multiple offers on most properties. Uh, our friends from Lend City Mortgages, Scott Dillingham and Jillian Irving joined us to let us know what they're seeing in the mortgage markets. For example, investors with bigger portfolios or just in general, investors who are running into roadblocks, getting more mortgages. Uh, some of them are actually switching from residential mortgages to commercial mortgages for either refinancing or that next investment property. And that the properties are still, uh, they can be single family home, duplex, triplex, whatever. Uh, but the mortgages, mortgages are commercial instead of residential, even though the use of the property is still residential, small residential. Also, appraisals have been keeping up with purchase prices generally, except on occasion when a buyer completely overpays and appraisers are human. So they will make human error. Uh, we had one this week where an appraisal came in about sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 under what the purchase price was. But uh, thankfully, we were able to pivot and get a second appraisal in there. And then everything worked out to everyone's uh, satisfaction. Uh, then we had uh, everyone's favorite real estate accountant, my Valentine, Cherry Chan, uh, shared about how a very complicated topic on how to save on capital gains. First off, capital gains is way better than, well, it's actually 100% better than personal income tax for tax purposes. It's one of the few tax benefits we as Canadians have, hence investing in real estate and stocks in the middle uh, for the middle and long term are so ideal. Uh, for our clients, we will make the recordings available to you. Uh, it was so great to see uh, so many like-minded individuals in person again, and I can't wait to do it all again on March 26th. So that will be Cherry and I's next real estate meetup in our offices uh, Saturday morning. I was recently asked by a group of uh, seven-figure business owners to present on the best practices of portfolio divers- diversification. As this group is uh, business owners, uh, they don't invest uh, nearly as much as I do. So they asked, uh, they somehow think that I'm an expert on this area. I'm no financial planner. Uh, but anyways, I'm going to give this presentation. The feedback was quite positive. Uh, so I'm just going to give this presentation to uh, our community on March 26th. Again, I'm no financial planner. Let me just clarify. No financial planner <laughs> will agree with what I'm going to share. <laughs> there might be a handful. There might be a handful out of the thousands of them. <laughs> but then I've been a part of helping everyday middle class Canadians who start with five or six figures of net worth grow to a couple million dollars in net worth. I'm happy to compare uh, my track record to any financial advisor because if you're that good, I would love to meet you. So. With the affordability, affordability challenges in, in housing in big cities, smaller cities outside the GTA have benefited uh, greatly. As I'm not sure if everyone reads the news as much as I do. <laughs> There's quite a few uh, news articles about how uh, we've seen a, a significant exodus from big cities to smaller cities. So on also on March 26th, we'll be sharing about opportunities east of the GTA in Belleville, Ontario. It's been garnering significant attention away from my Oshawa investor friends for its affordability and cash flow opportunity. 
prices are significantly better than the GTA, uh, and they're even better than Oshawa. So on Saturday, March 26th, we will be covering the city from an economic fundamentals perspective and also uh, showing you what we think, my team thinks, are opportunities to invest. You do not want to miss it. As I mentioned earlier, I'm no financial planner, uh, but one of my real estate clients who I coached to buy their first student rental back in 2011, I think it was, they bought a bungalow near McMaster University in the low 300s that cash flow beautifully. And they also helped them with, they bought a couple other properties along the way. And then just last week after the, after Saturday's, uh, real estate meetup, uh, I actually talked to them on the phone, congratulated them on a recent sale. Uh, we helped them sell that same property for just over a million dollars as part of their retirement plan. And yeah, they're on plan. So she's quitting her job next month to focus on living and traveling. I know some folks quit their jobs to become full-time real estate investors. Not in this case. This is retirement we're talking about. Uh, focus on living and enjoyment of the of life. Uh, the proceeds of the sale will fund their retirement and bankroll a larger stock hacking account to create cash flow. Uh, conservative napkin math, this bungalow uh, back in 2011-2012, uh, assume a 20% down payment and 20% for renovations. Uh, the return on investment is about four times between purchase and sale and renovations. Uh, so the investment is, is four, gone four times. I think that's easily a home run. Uh, for a conservative uh, 37% return per year. That's a straight average. 37% return on year per year before figuring uh, mortgage pay down and cash flow. If we were to add those in, the return per year would be in the high 40s. This news of our client retiring uh, made my month, made my day, made my week. I enjoy nothing more than helping people. And if you too would like to learn the best practices on investing in real estate and give yourself financial peace in the future, then check us out at any of our upcoming events. We host meetups, uh, free training, uh, Street Smart Tours, those are all separate events, and you can register for them. If you're already on my email list, uh, you get an email roughly every week or so letting you know when our events are running. And if you're not, well, that's just silly. You can go to infinitywealth.ca slash events to register for any of our upcoming events. On to this week's show, and I'm really excited to share it with you. There are many, many, many crypto experts out there, and I've always want, wanted to bring you my 16, 17-ish listeners, the best of the best. Like real estate, there are many experts. Many have reached out to me to come on the show to promote their book or their course or coaching, but uh, something didn't sit right with me. Maybe it's me just being too picky or analysis paralysis. Just, you know, I just kept on waiting for someone that that felt right. So being patient, it worked out uh, as it often does. So what happened was a recent, a more recent uh, good friend of mine was close personal friends with uh, Dimitri Buterin who is a super successful tech entrepreneur in his own right, having exited his own tech company for millions and millions of dollars in his early 40s, uh, so pretty recently. Uh, for those of you who spent any time in the cryptocurrency space, you'll recognize Dimitri's last name, Buterin, as it is the same as Vitalik Buterin, the 28-year-old billionaire from Toronto and founder of Ethereum. For those who don't know, Ethereum is the second in market capitalization to only Bitcoin, and then Ethereum is four times the market cap of third place Tether. So he's pretty OG, as I like to say, original gangster. Dimitri has, has a particularly fascinating story as he grew up during the fall of the Soviet Union. He actually, I believe he was born in Chechnya. Uh, he's a, so yes, he's Russian. Uh, so I asked his perspective of living under communism and comparing it to the Canada of today, uh, as some other folks I see on social media compare modern day Canada to communism. So let's ask the opinion of someone who actually lives in communism, lived through communism. You know, I have family in China, so I know what they think. <laughs> I asked Dimitri about raising kids, investing in general, and of course, cryptocurrency. Uh, and my favorite part was uh, near the end of the episode, how Dimitri's uh, outlook on life changed after selling his business just a few years ago. As always, when booking guests on the show, I look for interesting stories and stories um, from folks on the other side of all the hustle and bustle. Uh, Dimitri's built uh, and sold about three companies. And then what I'm interested in is, what does life look like on the other side of all that hustle and bustle? What do they do with their time and money and how they spend their time? This subject always fascinates me because in theory, we should be always be spending more time doing those things as if someone who's made it. We don't necessarily have to hustle and bustle all the time. Hopefully you enjoy this episode as much as I did producing it. Finally, as we are talking about risky investments, disclaimer from me, Erwin Cito, I am not an investment advisor, neither is Dimitri Buterin. All opinions are mine alone or theirs. 
There are risks involved in placing any investment in securities or in Bitcoin or Ethereum or any cryptocurrency or any stock or option in anything. None of the information presented herein is intended to form the basis of any offer or recommendation or have any regard to the investment objectives, financial situation, or needs of any specific person, and that includes you, my dear listener or reader. Everything you're going to hear is for informational entertainment purposes only. Please enjoy the show. Hello, Dima. What's, what's keeping you busy these days? Nothing is keeping me busy. I'm trying to stay away from being busy. It's like, you know, people like, oh, I'm so busy. Oh, I'm so busy. Ah. You know, life always is full of stuff. There are children and there is uh, the relationships and there is uh, there are wonderful books and uh, mm -hmm. cats to feed and uh, walks to take and businesses to look at. There's right. so much stuff always, right? But uh, yeah, busy. So then uh, what do you allow time for then? Again, like things come up and I listen to my heart, whether, you know, it resonates with me, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, if it does, and again, it's not like a mental decision-making process. Mm -hmm. This is how every human lives. It's just like we have complicated story about this, but really we have an instinctive emotional reaction to stuff. We engage with something or not, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have a complicated story explaining to other people like, oh, this is why and how I decided this and blah, blah, blah. And it's all bullshit. So. Mm -hmm. That's so awesome because you, you have such a <laughs> refreshing view because like you're on the other side of what many people are trying to achieve, like business building. Yes. And, yes. and uh, you've actually had a successful exit as well. Um, mm -hmm. I have lots of questions. <laughs> yeah, I have lots of answers. Hopefully many of them will confuse you, right? Because when we're confused, it. then we can finally open up to something new. I love it. You've been a part of owner, a uh, part of several multi-million dollar businesses. How did it all start? Pretty much by accident, you know, like uh, the first business, uh, I was working in a big company and a friend of mine, my colleague, uh, he um, suggested, hey guys, you know, let's look and, and uh, starting a business together. And there was an opportunity. And I really had no clue about business because I grew up in the Soviet Union, right? And Soviet Union, like there's no concept of, entrepreneurship or business right it's like the state does everything the state owns everything you're just a drone we take care of you we tell you where to go to work we pay you the amount of money that we decide and stuff like that right so it was a pure accident and uh and yeah definitely well actually maybe i should go a little bit back but then when uh before few years before that, when I was in the university and, and I observed and Soviet Union fell apart and, and then you have to survive and how do you survive? And then like, okay, you can buy this thing here and then you can sell it there. And, but I didn't even think about this as business, right? But that's basically what I did, I guess, as a student. So we had some micro entrepreneurship when I was a student, I guess. Um, and that helped me survive those years. And yeah, and then I went to work for some first for a bank, then for a big uh, U.S.-based corporation and uh, learned a lot. Uh, and then we started the first business and then we looked back. How hard was it growing up? You spent some time in Chechnya? Were you born there or? Yeah, I grew up there. Again, my history isn't great, but there were wars, were there not? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they started when I already left it, but there was always a lot of ethnic tension in the region. So, yeah. It's and like, then, you know, you ask any person about their childhood and they will give you a complicated story. But the truth is, like, you take any human being, however wonderful or difficult their childhood was, and there was, I guarantee you, there was always a whole range of different situations, right? And some joy and some laughter and some fun and some play and some pain and some fear and all kinds of stuff. It's like the human being is designed to if you will, to experience a full range of emotions, whatever the environment or the circumstances are. You come from pretty challenging upbringing. <laughs> so like, so for, for context, most of my listeners are Canadian. <laughs> right. So it's, it's very different, even if you have a tough time growing up as a Canadian versus growing up during a country's collapse. Yeah, but you know what? Like, I have some uh, awesome Canadian friends and they went through some really difficult stuff here yeah. too, right? Yeah. Like, you know abuse and their family and you know pretty extreme poverty and mm -hmm. stuff poverty right stuff like that so yeah mm -hmm. it's like it's not about the environment right it's really about the story that our minds build around that so any environment people can have all kinds of moments and emotions mm -hmm. 
So again, my history is not that strong. So like the burning question I had for you and when I messaged yeah. you about it as well is like, again, you, you experienced a, a collapse of, uh, of a country. Yeah. Say cryptocurrency, because I don't even know that much about cryptocurrency. So I'm going to yeah. position you as the expert. <laughs> yeah. At least between the two of us. <laughs> sure. If cryptocurrency existed the way it is today, would that have helped you at all during the collapse of the Soviet Union? Of course, right? And it's like, if you look back at history, right, any kind of collapse, any kind of difficulty, one of their uh, most challenging situations people face is that when they try to leave a certain country, right? And then they have accumulated some assets. And then how do you get out with your assets, right? Because everybody will try to rob you, steal them from you, take it away from you, whether the, the government, some bandits or whatever it is, right? So... And this is what I really think is awesome about crypto because this really gives takes the concept of uh, responsibility and self sovereignty to the next level, right? Like if you have crypto, nobody can really take it away from you, short of torturing you for your passwords and stuff, right? Like all those stupid forms in the border. Are you bringing into the US more than ten thousand US dollars and bullshit like this, right? Like you know. Why the fuck do we care? This is my money, right? That's my position on this, right? And with crypto, you have the full ownership of this and you have mm -hmm. full responsibility, right? Mm -hmm. I've seen people who have lost their passwords and they were not good at managing that. And if you do that, then nobody can ever help you. You know, the money is gone. So it's yours and uh, yours to keep and yours to lose. And it's a very new, very different concept, right? I think that... Uh, if you will, uh, crypto is really a reflection of a major transition we are seeing in the world, major ideological societal shift, if you will, right? Because growing up, if we look back previous few decades, uh, one of the ways I could describe this as the, the trust and in centralized institutions is crumbling, right? Like, do we trust governments? Of course not. They are stealing their own money. They are spending this on stupid shit. And then they are posturing on TV just, you know, to get good PR. Do we trust religious institutions? No. You know, look at all of this abuse of children, right? Do we trust big corporations? Of course not, right? They steal our data. And so, yeah, like, you know, none of those we are, we can trust. It's, it's pretty obvious to most people, you know, like we're in the process of that, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and crypto, starting with Bitcoin, that was the first, like, uh, the technology. Okay, now we can have money, which is not based on trusting anybody, which is based on actually based on not trusting anybody. You don't have to, you, mm -hmm. you assume that you cannot trust anybody, right? But then you can trust some computer code and whatnot, or you trust people's self-interest, if you will, right? And uh, that also connects to uh, me observing their dissolution of the Soviet Union, right? Because it was, they were trying to build country on a concept that people should be nice and good and peaceful and all of this bullshit, right? But people are all kinds of stuff, right? People have fears and greed and desires and whatnot. And whenever you try to deny that, you end up with something like Soviet Union, right? And Soviet Union killed tens of millions of their own people. Like, it's a crazy place. It's like, oh, I want to build this ideal, an ideal that doesn't exist in nature. And then you try to try to take nature and force it into that ideal. Uh, and then you end up killing tens of millions of people. Yeah. And that happened not once, right? It happens in Russia. That happens in China. It happened in China. That happened in a bunch of places, right? So hopefully by now we, we can learn from that, right? And how about instead of trying to simplify and idealize human nature, how about we try to recognize human nature right and human nature is infinite and unlimited with all yeah. of that stuff yeah so yeah back to crypto right so with bitcoin now we we can have digital assets digital money which is based on the fact that you don't have to trust anybody you can trust i guess you have to trust math if you don't believe into math then digital currency is probably not for you i think math is pretty decent like i can trust it it usually is reliable math and cryptography Mm -hmm. yeah. can, can you elaborate on in the context of bitcoin and why the math leads you to bitcoin as a solution oh i mean it really is about uh like bitcoin is an invention it's any kind of human invention right is based on a bunch of other inventions before right and bitcoin is built on a whole bunch of technologies and inventions right and uh 
how do you like uh, this whole mind in concept, right? So it's really based on a very important concept of, in cryptography of what's called the one way function. When you can take a huge, you know, let's say piece of data, file, whatever, right? And then you can encrypt it and then you will get a unique signature or, you know, whatever you call that, right? And, and, uh, and you can never reverse engineer that. So that's kind of one of their important pieces and uh, foundation of Bitcoin technological, right? And, you know, and you can spend a whole long podcast, many hours, like discussing a bunch of other aspects of this, but kind of let me just summarize it in simple ways that, you know, Bitcoin is based on a bunch of technologies which uh, use uh, complex uh, cryptographic uh, constructions and uh, which is really just like one of the areas of math. And this is why it works. You know, this is why people cannot, like, to give you one example, right? Is like uh, when you open an account in a bank, you uh, go to the bank and uh, they open you an account. Now they, you know, they give you a password, you have your account and all of this stuff. How does that work for in Bitcoin's case? It's very simple. You basically randomly pick an account number. How is that possible? What if somebody else already picked that account number? Well, the thing is like uh, the total number of possible accounts in Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency, I'm just using Bitcoin as the original uh, example. And the the probability of you getting the same account number as somebody else is uh, less than you uh, winning the lottery whole year in a row, I guess, right? Or something like that. So that's why there is no centralized place where you have to go for your account number. You just pick any account number and the account number comes with its, uh, it's called private key. So you can refer to this, I guess, as the password. And this is all that you need to start interacting with the system. Any books you recommend or sources for folks to start learning in, around cryptocurrency? Um, I'll have to send you a link. There, is, there is a bunch of awesome books, right? Like uh, one of them, I think, is by uh, this guy. Uh, I hope I remember his name correctly. Andreas Antonopoulos. I think he's got some really awesome books. Yeah, can a regular person understand it? <laughs> yes, uh, he. This guy, he's really good at explaining stuff in very simple ways. And uh, in general, about cryptocurrency, one of their newsletters, podcasts that I really. Uh, love and recommend to many people it's called bankless so the website is banklesshq.com and they do a really good job they you know they have different shows and they go into a lot of details some of them but they also have a lot of very basic very foundational uh, explanations like you know what is money and what is digital currency how is that related and all kinds of stuff like that uh, when someone's new to cryptocurrency is there, are there any first steps that you suggest to them and then I'll just preface yeah. it with start using it. Start using it. Yeah, because you know, like when people try, like, yeah, this is interesting. I should take my time to learn about this, and they never do, right? But you know, once you actually, and this applies to anything, right? Like real estate, for example, right? It's like you can read about this and whatever, but you know, once you get into your first deal, once you make your first investment or whatever it is, right? You start in this thing. Oh, this is how it works, right? Like, oh mortgages and this and that right like you know anything new that we look at it looks scary and complicated before mm-hmm. we start doing this right mm-hmm. but once it's and these days it's so it's very easy right like you know so get into a cryptocurrency what does it really mean it means like downloading an app installing an app then with most apps you can use your credit card to buy some cryptocurrency that's pretty much it now we have some cryptocurrency right then the next very complicated step is send some money to a friend who already uses that, right? And can, once you see that, once you see the simplicity of that, right? So really cryptocurrency, we used to, this, most people used to the concept that money is something that is managed by governments and banks and, you know, mismanaged really, right? But, you know, and they are in control of this and blah, blah, blah. But when you see how cryptocurrency works, you're like, where are the gatekeepers? Well, there are no gatekeepers. It's like, you know, and this is mind blowing, right? And you know, again, like it started with Bitcoin, and then all kinds of stuff happened, and now there is this whole revolution and NFTs, which is taking that to a whole another level. So, yeah, I have so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> One thing about cryptocurrency that I have, uh, that I try to separate for myself is there's currencies, there's what people feel can be a store value, and there's also right. the, all the technologies 
Right. I, I even have trouble separating that. Like there's ETH, like the currency for, for Ethereum. And there's also just what the technology actually is for. <laughs> right. And the same with Bitcoin, right? There's Bitcoin, the currency, and there is Bitcoin network, the technology. And then how many cryptos are you following? Following? I'm not really following any, right? And there, there are like thousands of them that now yeah. exist. Like, you know, the ones that matter. I mean, it's not like I, on a daily basis, I do a lot of stuff. I mean, Ethereum is the most useful, I would say, at this point, just because of what's been unfolding. But there may be a handful of others, like, you know, uh, uh, this uh, Polygon Matic is an uh, extension to Ethereum, which makes it mm, affordable and whatever. And there's a lot of stuff going on there. And, you know, what's called stable coins, the cryptocurrencies that are connected to national currencies. That was a big breakthrough, right? Because when I look back, let's say five years ago, people would get excited about crypt- current cryptocurrency, let's say, and they would go to their local stores like, hey, guys, you should use cryptocurrencies. And the guy like, what is this? And they get excited, like, okay, I'll use cryptocurrencies, right? Okay. And then they start using that and they realize that, okay, I got paid in crypto. So yes, there are some customers who will do that. And then next day, it might be up 10% or 20% or down 10%, 20%, right? And in a typical store, they have a margin of like, I don't know, 10%, if that, right? So it's really using cryptocurrency is not a feasible way. It was not a feasible way for most businesses to operate until uh, stable coins were invented. And stable coins are a special kind of cryptocurrency, which are linked in their value to some kind of national currency. Most of the current stable coins are linked to US dollar just historically, uh, but they're linked to others, right? And this means that now in a store, people can pay you with uh, something like DAI or USDC, USDT, and you really you get the equivalent of US dollars. And uh, when the market is going up and down like crazy, those particular cryptocurrencies are the same in relation to your national currency. So, so that's uh, that makes it much more feasible for people to use on day to day daily transactions. Are the transaction fees lower? Is that part of the motivation to transact use this as a currency? Uh, it's a separate angle to that you know so it's not necessarily uh, transaction fees are a function of uh, underlying blockchain technology right and stable coins they can be issued on top of any blockchain technology right so you can have a stable coin like right now most stable coins are issued on ethereum and ethereum itself has a uh, really high commission fees because it's demanded by supply and demand and there's lots and growing demand so stable coins on top of Ethereum are not a great choice currently for people to use in like day-to-day retail businesses and stuff. But Ethereum has a whole bunch of uh, extensions, uh, and you know they usually refer to as uh, level two rollups and stuff like that, and you know uh, side chains. And uh, some of them they specifically designed. Uh, well, actually, most of them they are really targeting very low commissions. So they're designed to be very inexpensive. So you're actually kind of using Ethereum, but you don't, it's kind of hidden from you because you're using an extension of that. And that makes it uh, very inexpensive. So now you can have your stable coin and you use an extension of Ethereum, something like, you know, whatever it is, Arbitrum, Optimism. And uh, that makes commissions very low. So now you actually have something that's very feasible to use uh, in uh, pretty much any situation. I asked the question because I'm wondering uh, what businesses are uh, are at risk then, like Visa, MasterCard, banks. Yeah, I mean, last <laughs> year, uh, Ethereum has already moved more value than Visa, right? Because like one metaphor for Ethereum is the payment network, right? And uh, I don't remember the exact numbers, but I think Visa moved $10.4 trillion over its system overall as a kind of one metric. And Ethereum moved like $11 trillion over its system over the last year so. So it's already, uh, you know, uh, there's already more usage for crypto than uh, for traditional payment systems. And we're still early, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. Because I, I still, see, I, like among my friends, especially real estate investors, I see quite a bit of adoption, small yeah. amounts, but they are adopting. Yeah. Like Bitcoin, Ethereum. Yeah. I mean, and when I look at this, it's like there's so much stuff that can be automated in real estate and made so much more transparent, right? And uh, just like... Uh, 
all of that uh, title searches and escrow and whatnot. Like it's really just a few basic lines of code, like when the systems are well integrated. So that can definitely uh, make it bring down the cost of transactions very, very significantly. Yeah, I'd love to see that in the real estate space, a more transparency, speed. Yeah. Um, it's such a challenge. <laughs> Here's a real estate example. Like if I want to check if there's any, if the, if the permits are closed on a property, it's actually, it's a manual process for the city yeah. <laughs> to do. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like, you gotta be kidding me. They, 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 have to like, they actually have to go physically to a different room <laughs> and go mm. find the files. <laughs> like the yeah. Hard copy it's files. It's pretty archaic, yeah. Who knows how how long that'll take to be digitized? <laughs> kind yeah. of embarrassing, really. Uh, and then, uh, Dima, one of, one of the objections that uh, I find novices to cryptocurrency space is uh, they'll say, you know, like China's already doing it. Is they're coming out with their own digital currency? They already have their own digital currency. I keep reading news of the states that they're that they're already talking about it behind the scenes. Canada, the same thing. How is that the same or different than what we're talking about? Uh, a centralized bank's digital currency. Right. I mean, if you think about this, modern currency is pretty much digital already, right? It's just like uh, the central bank keeps, if you will, the central ledger of all the money, right? But then it delegates record keeping to uh, banks. The banks then handle, you know, the issuance of credit, their personal accounts and stuff like that. So it's already digital. We still use cash and whatnot. But when people talk about government issued uh, cryptocurrencies, well, uh, the question is like, do you trust your government? That's really the question. Do you trust them to not mismanage the money? And I think for many people, their answer is no. Like, of course I don't trust them. Of course mm-hmm. those fuckers will just overspend and print money. And, you know, like that's what they've been doing for the last 50 years, right? Like, why would they change now? So that's really their question. It's like, and in cryptocurrencies, it's the same. You know, there are some cryptocurrencies which are not government issued, but something like XRP. Like the supply of that currency is like they kind of printed a huge unlimited, I mean, not unlimited, but, you know, the bulk of the supply is just the bunch of uh, the original creator of that given to themselves, right? So, so it's not really, for me, it's not attractive at all because I don't trust you guys. Like, you know, if you own whatever it is, like 95% of the supply, then like, that's it, right? So government issued uh, digital currencies, well, they basically, it's really, we're talking about changing some underlying technologies of current national currencies, which are all digital, just to use some of the aspects of blockchain technologies, right? But they still want the control. They still want the ability to print the money on demand and whatnot. And that's really uh, very different from the spirit of what has been invented. All right, here's a dumb question. <laughs> Gold or Bitcoin? Every person will have the answer, right? Right. It's like depends on the place, right? Uh, looking at gold, right? Uh, when I look at this, it has not done that that well over the no, last whatever 10, 15 years, right? So with all this money printing going on, it's really strange. <laughs> it is very strange, right? But it's it's kind of bulky and it's inconvenient, right? So digital currencies seems to have done much better for the same, you know, let's say last ten years or whatever it is, right? So yeah, I would say at this point, Bitcoin or, you know, not just Bitcoin, but many other cryptocurrencies, they are more useful than gold. So the last, we've, there's been tons of volatility for like the whole history of cryptocurrency. There's been a ton of volatility. Yeah. Um, what kind of investment horizon should someone have if they're, if they're interested in buying some of this, especially if it's significant? Yeah, I would say like three, five years. Three, five years? So short-term volatility, yeah, that's like, it's going to be crazy. But if you can, uh, like, if I look back, all the cycles, they've been like a few years long, if you will, right? So if you can afford to not touch that for at least three, four years, then I think that you're in a good position to uh, significantly, uh, I mean, there's always risk, of course, right? But uh, there is a higher chance uh, that you will significantly increase your investment over that time horizon. Mm-hmm. Right. So if I look at real estate, I would probably say that. So I invest uh, into some real estate through this uh, uh, company here in Toronto called uh, Greybrook. And uh, typical uh, return on investment in projects through them is maybe around 20, 25% a year, mm-hmm. which is pretty decent, right? But it's uh, compared to crypto, right? And crypto, that's <laughs> probably at least 100% a year. But again, like one year, you might be down. 80%, right? And whatever. 
time horizon that that's a great question it's like some like somebody recently asked me oh you know like my girlfriend she really needs to make some money and this and that she's thinking about investing in cryptocurrencies i'm like okay what is her time horizon and he's saying well she needs to make some significant returns uh within like six months i'm like run away from cryptocurrencies yeah real estate right? too <laughs> yeah real estate too right <laughs> of course right and i mean what's the like yeah gambling probably is your best option then. <laughs> i'm sure we could brainstorm some other ideas that'd be terrible <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then i don't know how to frame the question so the question is more around um some of our crypto friends are like hold on just hold buy and hold or dollar cost averaging can you describe your own strategy? Well, I got into cryptocurrency quite a long time ago, and I really I been pretty much holding. You know, uh, I I tried how to put this. I I did a bit of trading a long time ago, but the thing is, like, even before getting into cryptos, when I tried trading with stocks and other stuff, I realized that I suck as a trader. So I, I learned that okay, you know what? Like, I suck at this, but I'm really good at holding. So yeah, I'll do that. And then um, I find um, the psychology of a trader is it's not an easy one. I think only select few have that men- can have that mental toughness to trade. Exactly. Uh, it's really about psychology, understanding your own psychology, right? And, you know, all the impulse. It's like uh, I saw this little post a couple of days ago, and it's, it's so true, right? It's like right now, you know, when let's take Ethereum. It was uh, very recently at like $4,000 US per unit, right? And back then, like there were so many people who would, probably would have bought if they had an opportunity to buy 2500 So now it's 2500 right? And the same people would not buy it. Why? Of course, it's psychology, right? Because like, oh, it went down. Like, what are the reasons, you know, and all of that. So I think that also when we look at uh, any kind of investment, or whether that stocks, you know, real estate even, I guess, uh, or crypto, like different perspectives, right? And, you know, we, some of their two most basic models or perspectives are fundamental and technical analysis, right? So mm-hmm. technical analysis, is like what's the momentum where it's going, right? And the fundamental is like, what is the fundamental? And this is also really important because a few years ago, cryptocurrencies, they, they didn't really have fundamentals. It was really all momentum based. But now most let's call them blue chip cryptos, they actually have very solid fundamentals in terms of if you look at kind of uh, there are different models now, like what's the revenues, right? Like if you take something like uh, Ethereum network, so people are paying like, I forgot the exact number, but let's say $40 million a day to use the system. So yeah, there is demand, right? Okay. And that's now been pretty stable for a long time and it goes up and down, but right. yeah, people want right and one metaphor that i use for uh blockchains and specifically for ethereum you can think of this as a very trusted notary right so your transactions you send them to the system and you pay for the system to check your transactions and then put their stamp of approval now your transactions are not arised and checked and you know now you have this uh fully trustless trustful uh register of transactions and uh, all of that stuff and then, uh, like, like we were talking about the psychology, how often do you check? Because what I've noticed is people check prices too often. And I don't think that's good for their mental health. Yeah, every human being will end up checking or not checking. And it's not like there's some kind of magical recipe, right? Like, uh, I notice I'm a human too, right? So I notice that the markets are up and exciting, then I can check like, oh, it's going up. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at this, right? When it's going down, actually, I stop checking. And I mean, pretty much on my Twitter feed, I will, I will know what it is. I don't really have to check, but that's just human nature, right? And then do you do any stocks? You mentioned stocks earlier. Uh, not personally, no. Again, like I've learned that I suck at that, but I have some money placed with like an investment management firm and they do a decent job of, you know, with like stocks and bonds and stuff like that. Okay. So yeah, so you are, you have exposures to someone else manages yeah, it for you. I have exposure to stocks and, uh, and real estate and crypto. Got it. And then I have no idea what the answer to this is. Does <laughs> does crypto have any effect on the stock market? <laughs> I mean, everything is correlated, right? In yeah. this world, right? So maybe the I better guess, question is, yeah, what industries will crypto disrupt? Mm, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, and disrupt um, usually means a bad thing for them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, well, it, it doesn't have to, right? Because uh, the question is true. Like, yes, many, many, many existing companies can benefit greatly from. Uh, 
adopting their technologies, but it's really hard. Like we've seen the cycle with internet, right? We've seen the cycle with all other technologies because once you've built a new, you know, your business and, you know, it's big and it's making money, you're very much invested in your existing technologies. And then all the new stuff, it looks uh, risky and gimmicky and, uh, and whatnot, right? And that's the case with this. But look at this, for example, Twitter. Twitter, I love Twitter per fun, actually. Yeah, I mean, that's my main social media now, right? And for a long time, especially with, for some reason, Jack has a lot of objection to any cryptocurrency outside of Bitcoin, right? They could have benefited so much from all the unfolding stuff in crypto, but they've been really fighting that for a long time. Interesting. Recently, it seems like their position have been changed. And Facebook have been trying to embrace the digital, right? But again, like it's hard for them because it's also requires them for to rethink a lot of the stuff about them, right? Because they're used to doing things in a very centralized manner, right? For those corporations. And crypto is really about uh, decentralized, uh, about giving up control, if you will, right? And that's very scary. That's kind of what government's trying to do. They're trying to build, okay, you know what? So this is a powerful technology. So let's now try to take the control. But the thing is like this technology is so attractive to people exactly because it's not controlled by a bunch of centralized people who have proven themselves to be really incompetent crooks, you know? So, mm-hmm. so Dima, I'll, I'll let you decide where we go. I want to either ask you about uh, your business was uh, like Wild Apricot was over a hundred employees mm-hmm. or would you like to talk about what life is like on the other side of after having exited? Uh, I mean, life has no sides, right? It just like it has in- infinite number of sides. Okay, let's talk about what was your lifestyle like when you did operate, you know, uh, a multi multi million dollar tech company with a hundred plus employees versus like how your life is now. Because that's one of the reasons right. I wanted to have you on the show. Is I, I see yes, all these people. But you see, it's like um, how to put this. It's not that one defines the other. Mm-hmm. They are just aspects of uh, different a uh, different times in our lives, we end up doing different things and mm-hmm. having different priorities, right? When I had my first exit and it was like, you know, the first business and I got a few million dollars and I haven't stopped for a single day because, you know, the mindset was, no, 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 I have to keep doing stuff. And I took all of that money and invested into the new business and all of that, right? Uh, and when I had my latest exit, I handled that very differently. Well, because I'm different now than I was 20 years ago. And then what's life like now? Because that's one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on the show, because I see all these people who are busting their butts. Uh, yeah. I'm not really sure what drives them. I'm sure some of them think that whatever they're driving towards would bring them happiness. Yeah, that, that's all that we do. That's all every human does, right? Subconsciously. It's just like every human has a different set of programming and diff, you know, in terms of what is the hope that will bring them that happiness that they think that they can mm-hmm. get, right? And for some people, it's happy family life or happy relationship or lots of love or lots of sex or whatever, right? Or maybe taking care of their kids. So for some people, it's achieving stuff, right? And when I look at a, a lot of successful entrepreneurs, yeah, it's like for a lot of them, it's really, there's a lot of subconscious drive toward like oh when i get this then i really will mean something and it's really i mean end of the day we craving safety and love right humans are very simple but uh, they are also very complicated so those very basic very simple fundamental Mm -hmm. motivations that are in the foundation of every human then they they can manifest themselves in very complicated ways in so many humans and building a business uh, creating awesome art, uh, saving animals, uh, you know, improving, you know, building a better world or whatever it is. So was your, your interest changed then after most, your last exit that you, rather than reinvesting, start a new company? Yes, I would say that. Um, I would say that uh, my psychology is quite different from what it was a few years ago. What's what's different? Can you share what's different? Priorities have changed? Um, well, that's an outcome, right? Like end of the day, what we do is based on our belief systems, right? And all the structures that we build on our mind, like what is the world, what is me, uh, where it's all going and stuff like that. Uh, so most human beings, they live in uh, this uh, mental model of uh, here's me, this meat bag, and uh, here's me, this soul or whatever inside of this thing, and here's the world, and I'm interacting with the world, and I'm 
and I can improve. Well, I mean, again, their their achievement model is not the only model, right? Like I'm sure that again, we're talking about entrepreneurial mind view, but there are many others, many other models before that, right? There are many people who live in uh, the mental model of a victim. Here's me, here's this unjust, cruel world that is doing stuff. And all I can do is just somehow suffer and struggle against it. That's that's one very common model, right? Then there is an entrepreneurial mind view, if you will, model when I'm an achiever, I can do stuff, I can build stuff, right? And again, that's another model, right? And then there are other models beyond that. And there are some awesome models about models, like Ken Wilber is famous for his stuff. Uh, so for me, like my mind model have has shifted a lot, right? I I no longer see myself as uh, being this soul inside of this meat robot interacting with this world, like all of that stuff is me. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> Dima, I have to ask you, because uh, you possibly deserve father of the year or father of the decade awards. <laughs> <laughs> You've raised uh, successful kids. Vitalik is the one that uh, most people are familiar with. Like you, you raised a billionaire. <laughs> what's, what's the secret? <laughs> you know what? And not just a very important assumption, right? Because for most I people, guess, it's I, know like, where you, oh, I know where you're coming yeah, from. <laughs> but I mean, it's like, oh, billionaire, right? Oh, that's very successful, right? But the question is like, you know, again, people assume that when they have something, you know, whether that this relationship, you know, a billion dollars, then I'll be so just happy, so awesome. And that's not the case at all, right? That's most entrepreneurs that I know, they build business and maybe they have an exit, but then they cannot, they just have to keep building another business, right? And uh, yeah. because uh, we humans are just a collection of uh, mental patterns. We do stuff the way we do, right? And uh, and back to Vitalik, uh, I'm happy that he doesn't care that he's a billionaire or not, because for him, it's like, where he doesn't own a car, he, you know... <laughs> He maybe, owns, ever <laughs> no, he maybe owns a few pairs of pants and stuff like that, right? So it's like, <laughs> so for me, it's like, uh, I'll say this, a successful human in my definition of uh, the world now is really a human who is free and happy and free and happy, not because of something, but because of the recognition that this is the essential nature of being mm-hmm. human. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah, and uh, Vitalik, you know, uh, an amazing human being, achieved a lot, you know, invented this amazing technology that is uh, now impacting the world in this, this major ways. And uh, why is he this way? I can say, oh, it's all my my impact, right? Well, it's like my impact and the impact of hundreds of other people around him and uh, the circumstances and his grandparents and Canada and all of this. So every human being... Like we we always try to find simple causality. This is in this way because of that, right? Mm-hmm. And it's always bullshit. Like, you know, causality doesn't work this way. That mm-hmm. just human minds wants to simplify everything, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, why are we sitting here and talking to you right now, right? Because of so many things, right? And I can give you, I can tell you one, right? Because, you know, my friend Dmitry, okay? Why is Dmitry my friend? You know what? Because 40 years ago, where it does. 35 years ago, I went to this place because I was interested in electronics and stuff. And I met him there, right? Like, so every situation that we can look at, if we look at all of the factors, right, that went to the station, unlimited number of factors, right? So yeah, I don't really believe in causality the way people think about it. So I read about you that uh, you grew up, like there, you had a lot of books in your home growing yeah. up. Yeah, yeah. There were like hundreds or maybe a couple of thousand books and I was a voracious reader. I uh, learned to read very early on and uh, that's what I've been doing, yeah. And then uh, how how many books do you read in a week or a month now? It really depends. You know, some weeks might be zero, some weeks it might be five books and who knows. I'm guessing you're a fast reader. (laughs) I'm pretty fast reader, but uh, I, you know, I would generalize this as I I know that there is a lot of curiosity Mm -hmm. in me and I'm Mm -hmm. just curious about stuff. And these days, there are books, you know, there are, there's a lot of stuff on whatever social media and everywhere where you look at inside of yourself, all these emotions and things and the human beings mm-hmm. and animals and uh, snow outside. And then was this the same for your kids then? You, you, you had a lot of books in the home when they were growing up? 
they read a lot? Well, I switched to digital books quite a while ago, 15 years ago, right? So, so when Vitalik was growing up, yes, that there was lots of books. And, you know, I was also kind of trying to give him access to computers and stuff because that's something that I was craving as a kid. And as you, as you probably know, being a father, we always kind of try to relieve our lives through our children. And mm -hmm. whatever we didn't have, we try to give them when it's possible. Mm -hmm. It's a common pattern, right? For my daughters, I mean, we have a bunch of books, but not as many. And uh, they love to read, but it's mostly fiction stuff, mm -hmm. right? I, I read some fiction, but I read a lot of other stuff like about math and engineering and physics and science and psychology and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So Would you say Vitalik is a driven individual or is it just his curiosity in trying to create something was what led him to his success? It really depends on your definition of driven, right? But for, for most people, driven means that uh, it's somebody who is like, you know, this is the goal. We will achieve this goal. We'll get to this goal. Mm -hmm. And uh, some other synonyms for that is like uh, fanatical or passionate. Mm -hmm. And in a way that, I mean, that can be very powerful, but also... Uh, people who are quote unquote driven mm -hmm. can also live and they awake a whole bunch of destruction and mm -hmm. uh, and whatnot, right? So I'm personally not a huge fan of that particular pattern, and I actually think that uh, it's much. So back to your question about Vitalik, the creation of Ethereum is is very different from Bitcoin. So for if you talk to many people who are really into Bitcoin and just Bitcoin, for them it's like. Bitcoin is like a fuck you for governments. You know, we, us against them, we build them this new awesome things. Like yeah, fuck yeah. those bastards, right? Yeah. There's a lot of this. Let the world burn. I'm going to make so right? much money. <laughs> Ethereum is very different. Ethereum community, not just Vitalik, but he was kind of the foundation of this. But it's more like, you know what? Here's an awesome technology and look at all of this cool stuff. It's more like childish, playful stuff. And not like childish, not, not, but not in a bad way, but it's more like in in the more like let's create cool stuff let's yeah. create this cool technologies and you know and build and look at this in amazement how much we can achieve and build and uh, i find that pattern more attractive to me just mm -hmm. because it's not trying to fight something it's like you, you know what when people are trying to lose weight many people people who like weight is bad i'm going to lose the weight and like They they can do this for a while, but usually then they fail, right? But when mm -hmm. they you if you really want to achieve something, right? You're not fighting something, but you created something new. Like you know, I want to be healthy. I want to have a healthy weight and all of that stuff as a much more, if you will, constructive position. So th that's kind of uh, I would say my perception of Vitalik psychology is much more for constructive position. It's like let's create something new instead of like let's fight something bad. So I have a parenting question. Uh, so my, my interests are in real estate. I'm heavily invested in real estate. I do some stock stuff as well. And I'll give that exposure to my kids. And, mm -hmm. uh, but just seeing, just seeing how the world is going and uh, the sex, sex, success of people who understand computer science and programming, um, yeah. how important is that for kids? Like, do all your kids get exposure to computer programming and science? Well, exposure they do get right the question is like do they like it or not like right. i would love my daughters to be more interested and in, involved in that in that but that doesn't seem to be the case mm -hmm. my older daughter misha she is much more of a creative person she's an artist she's awesome at drawing and doing all kinds of other creative stuff mm -hmm. my youngest daughter katya she's more I mean, she's not really into computers and such and sciences, but she likes building stuff and games. So, so she likes playing in Roblox and Minecraft and creating stuff there. So I think that they will discover. So I think that for a uh, modern human, the whole aspect of uh, using computer technology, it's really an essential aspect of uh, how we're going to interact with the world, create, you know, new things and, and whatnot. Even mm -hmm. when I talk to artists, like, you know, lately I've been more involved in uh, NFT space and there's a lot of art there, but also people create a lot of really awesome art now, which is uh, intersection of art and uh, computer science, right? Some kind of programmable art and whatnot. So, yes, I think this is uh, an essential skill for more than human being. And so for any parent listening, including myself, <laughs> how mm -hmm. do you introduce... Uh, computer programming science to kids like anything right we love to play so let's find a way to play games right and mm -hmm. that's that's why i think that uh, 
so much education is uh, failing when they're just trying to force feed children or adults who is like, oh, let's learn this information and stuff. But we hate this stuff. We want to play, right? And they're yeah. awesome. Uh, I forgot uh, the names of this, but when my kids were younger, I was giving them, there are some awesome games where you learn uh, basic programming by just construction stuff and moving things around. So it's like visual programming languages. There are some really awesome apps uh, for that. So I think that find those and try to help your kids have fun instead of like trying to tell them, oh, this is important for your future. They don't care, Mm -hmm. right? (laughs) That's a good point. I, I have one. Of, my wife bought one of those on Amazon. I need to find it. Like you just move yeah. like mirrors around. And there's a light and you're trying to, right. you're trying to right. solve it. But I mean, even like uh, software apps, right? Um, especially on iPad. There are some really awesome and the names they escape me. But if I open my uh, iPad, I can find some. But uh, there are some really awesome apps where kids can teach basics of programming. And basically, they just like create scenes. It's like, okay, here's like this... Uh, and it's it's applicable to kids as young as like three, four years old because, oh, here's a beautiful thing. And now you want this character to move from left to right. How do you do this? And you do it in this way. And, you know, you pull those blocks and you say, move from one to ten or whatever it is, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, there are many wonderful apps nowadays that help kids learn about programming computers in, in a fun way. So I know nothing about Roblox and Minecraft. <laughs> Are those good uh, They're to introduce? pretty good for older kids, right? And okay. again, like, uh, and Minecraft is, uh, is more like, uh, my analogy would be like a Lego construction set, right? And, uh, and Roblox, I just kind of see my kids playing. I, I don't know that much about this, but I know that I've noticed that my kids have done some fun, cool stuff. Like they've built structures. They actually played some like games where you like, business and you were like a restaurant so they there's a like kids learn stuff through playing and uh when i look at that i can most parents like oh my parents or my kids should not be spending this much time on computers and this and that well who said that and why right their lives will be immersed in digital screens and devices right so that playing stuff them learning like a lot of this stuff it's essential for their future life that's how I look at this. And yeah, I mean, those things, they can be crazy addictive and, you know, whatnot. But I also, I have a belief in humans. I think that uh, humans can have, uh, you know, addiction is not a problem. It's a symptom of some stuff inside of us, right? And uh, I think that the more we can uh, contribute to love and support uh, our kids in terms of their emotional well-being, then you know, addiction, whether that be with devices or chemicals or anything else, are not a problem. So Dima, before we were recording, I, was, I asked if I could ask this. <laughs> so um, I, I presume this was after one of your your last exit, but you mentioned in, in, the, in a blog post you wrote online, in your early 40s, you're doing some experimentation and then you wrote that your worldviews have changed. Can, can you share what, what, what you meant? How has your worldviews changed? I'm not sure what particular blog post you're referring to, but let me put it this way. Or just share whatever your worldviews are today. For a long time, I've been, uh, I grew up as an atheist. In Soviet Union, it was all about atheism, you know, religion is bad and blah, blah, blah. So for a long time, I had a very uh, strong resistance to anything religious. And then spirituality for me was just like one of the types of religion. And I had very strong resistance to that. And then I came across this book by Sam Harris. It's called Waking Up. Uh, and that book was really helpful and, you know, was one of the factors changing my mindset around this. And uh, the subtitle of the book was Spirituality Without Religion. And kind of that book helped me take a different, find a different perspective about uh, what is spirituality, what is religion. And eventually, actually, many other books and other stuff, I came to the conclusion, I mean, I no longer have any resistance. Like I can see, uh, in my mind, I can see that all of the religions, they're based on the same core insight, whether that's, you know, Christianity or Buddhism or Islam or Islam or whatever. And then that core insight is inevitably is misinterpreted by humans and uh, all kinds of superstitions and bullshit is added on top of it and it's misused. I mean, again, that's that's us being human. 
And in that book, there was also a chapter about uh, psychedelics. And again, growing up in the Soviet Union with all of the propaganda and whatnot, like one of the aspects of this, I was totally brainwashed. So like uh, drugs are bad, right? And then I read this book and uh, he's saying, oh, you know, these substances that people refer to as drugs, the psychedelics specifically, things like LSD and magic mushrooms and whatnot, you know, here's what kind of effect they can have on people and here's how it can affect their views and, and whatnot. And uh, I got really curious about that, even though I had a lot of resistance, but I still had enough openness to explore that. And I, for the next year, I kept researching this and reading a whole bunch of books uh, about this. And eventually, when I was 42, I had my first experiment and I tried LSD and then I tried magic mushrooms and I tried other uh, things. And uh, it was really fascinating, right? Because like first in my research, I had to convince myself that they are not this dangerous, addictive shit that I assumed them to be. But when I looked at the data, I realized also things like alcohol. Alcohol is the most, is the worst fucking drug you can imagine. It's, uh, it's the worst in terms of harm and addiction, worse than heroin and cocaine and all other stuff, you know, like for me, that was like mind blowing because everybody around me is like, Oh yeah, I'll see you this and let's find that. And like, oh, yeah, it's addiction and cancer and like liver and, you know, mental uh, effect. Right. So anyways, and when I looked at other things and tried them, then the way I think about this is uh, whenever mind gets into a different state, right. It's like, we have a certain picture of who we are and uh, we build this picture over many years and uh, that picture gets kind of frozen for most people. Oh, I'm me. I'm, I'm shy. I'm this, whatever. And for different people, uh, they can, it can get stuck on like, here are my good sides or here are my bad sides. And then a lot of uh, weight is given to that. But how is that picture is, uh, is built is really built by the human being constantly observing themselves observe themselves and then put in that into story. So, you know, like I behaved in this way here, I behaved in this way there. Okay, now this is my story. And now actually it becomes, my story becomes my reality, right? And it's uh, difficult for people to change. And uh, things that uh, can help people access a different mental state gives your brain a very different perspective. Like, oh my God, I thought that this is me and this is the world. And they realize. What about this emotions that I have? What about the thoughts that I have? You know, and human being can start developing a new updated picture of yourself, right? And uh, so I think that that can be a wonderful, wonderful uh, tool for many humans to explore uh, themselves. And one of their awesome books on this topic is, uh, I forgot his name, famous writer. It's called How to Change Your Mind. Michael, somebody, a really wonderful book. And the guy was in his 60s, I believe, and he kind of got interested in this topic and he researched that. He did some experimentation and the book is really about his learning about this and self-experimentation. So I think it tells a pretty good story about this. And yeah, I think that uh, for me personally, uh, probably was one of the factors on this uh, ongoing journey of me understanding myself. What is that being human? What is that having emotions and thoughts and, and patterns and what is the world, what are, what is relationships, what is other humans and what is trauma, what is psychology. So, so much stuff. With that many questions, I can see why you need a lot of free time to explore. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I have to ask, oh, when you were experimenting, were you uh, self-experimenting or were you doing it under, uh, under supervision? Well, I was scared as hell. So... <laughs> I would like be too. Even, <laughs> even after all of my reading and research, and you know, now you, it's kind of like uh, I'll give you this example. If you tried VR, right, and if yeah. you do VR, and one <laughs> of their apps in VR is like when you put VR glasses, and there is a, a board, but the board is on top of a building, and now you're walking on this board, right? Yeah, yeah. And your mind knows you're in your room. Yeah. It's totally safe, but you still get scary and walking yeah. and wa all of this stuff, right? So. The human mind is, uh, has all of this fears and preconceptions. So all of those things, uh, I think that uh, it's really important to... I am a person by nature who is very cautious. And, you know, so I think it's really important to do your homework, do that with the proper, in the proper, safe, comfortable environment and stuff like that. Because uh, 
and uh, under their correct supervision, right? And I'm really excited that in uh, many countries now, in Canada specifically, there are practitioners now who are trained in that, who can provide you with a safe environment, who can look after you, who can make the assessment because uh, those things, uh, they have their downsides too. Like for some people with uh, specific like uh, types of psychology, like bipolar disorders and whatnot, they can really worsen their symptoms and they function, right? So again, it's important to approach things with their extreme caution, uh, whatever. So yeah, initially it was really a little tiny bit of self-experimentation with, and also with support of some well-meaning friends, but also I found a number of really awesome practitioners who support people who, who want to do that. They do a really good job of educating you, supporting you, during the experience, after the experience, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have some friends in the psychedelic space, uh, psilocybin specifically. Yeah. If you ever want an introduction, just let me know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what have you learned? Like, What could you share about... Uh, what have you learned about relationships, for example? I mean, it's a big question. Uh, I can or just something that uh, stands out yeah. to you. But, you know, what have I learned? Just like, has something... Has anything like... You know, you mentioned changing your mind. I find right. so many people have trouble changing their mind. Uh, is there something yes. you've changed your mind about? Yeah, I mean, like, for example, I no longer believe it's my mind. It's just mind, right? And uh, if we go back to relationships, most humans live in the perception that uh, I feel bad because of this happened. And then they find somebody to blame. For some people, is a self-blame. And for other people, it's like blaming some of the human and maybe the government. Oh, I feel bad because government and COVID restrictions and blah, blah, blah. And uh, my perspective on all of this stuff is very different now. Like, uh, I kind of see that uh, in every human, there is a whole, there is accumulation of emotions and uh, typical ways of thinking about the world. And then all of this stuff happens. And, uh, and depending on your existing emotions, especially on all of the, let's call it trauma, or, you know, sometimes I call it just stuck emotions from your childhood. And depending on all all of the beliefs that have been programmed into you, you will have a certain reaction to things, right? And two humans can have absolutely opposite reactions to the same exact thing, right? And you know that you can argue with people and like, Trump is good. No, Trump is bad. Or, you know, Justin Trudeau is good at that. Well, he's neither. It's like, you know, Every human being, actually, the way I think about this, they, they live in their own totally unique universe. And they have their own unique judgments about things and uh, what's happening about whatever, right? So in a relationship, most of the time, people argue who has the correct story. Right. This is how it is. No, this is how it is. And right. they're, they're trying to convince each other, like, oh, this is the fact. Like, fuck you and your facts. This is the fact. And this is <laughs> life, right? Well... Now I can see that it's like, yeah, here's my story, here's your story, and none of them are correct. It's just like, this is just two different humans having two different perspectives. Yeah. And I find that uh, what is really important, and also you know that from your, your training experience, I hope, that end of the day, it's really about deep connection to emotional makeup, right? When you're in the EO forum and you're going through a presentation, right? You're not asking people to give you recipes, like answers to your quote unquote problem, but right. people try to connect very deeply. Like, okay, when I was in a situation that was, and I experienced emotions similar to what you were experiencing, and this is how I handle that, right? Yes. And then you mind, then your mind, you can take those perspectives and you can kind of think about them. And they, you might come up with a new perspective on things, right? And that, but that applies to any kind of conversation, right? Instead mm-hmm. of like, talking about whose story is correct, can we try to go a little bit deeper and understand what is the underlying emotion here? What is this human being uh, feeling? And uh, what are the emotions that are hard for us to sense? Mm -hmm. Like, for example, most of my life, I was very uncomfortable with uh, the emotion of anger in myself or in others. Like, on the one hand, you can say it was positive because it was uh, hard to impossible for me to get angry at others. But also, it was very difficult for me to interact with other humans who do have that emotion, especially if that emotion is, uh, is stuck in them, you know, like, so anyways, and now it's just, okay, here's the emotion of anger. Here's the emotion of deep sadness. Here's the, whenever we stop trying to run away from our emotions, this is actually when we find that peace and happiness that we're looking for, it's not found in achieving some 
perfect, happy, idealized state. There's no such thing. It's really about there's ever changing and flowing kaleidoscope of emotions and states and everything. Tima, that was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and painful and everything. It's like, you know, so now when I talk to my girlfriend and she's going through some, and we have a challenging, difficult conversation, right? Instead of like me trying to convince her that you have a wrong story about something, now I can like sense her emotions and I can just give her a hug and maybe we can cry together, right? But I ha- I don't have a need to convince her in anything. Like she is a human being and she knows what is right, if you will, from her perspective. Mm-hmm. And uh, end of the day, we humans just want to be accepted, understood. And, you know, like, and we want to, again, we're getting really philosophical, but it's like end of the day, a human being who is upset and they experience certain emotion, whether that sadness, anger, despair, whatever it is, the best help we can give them is not to tell them, no, 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 it's okay. Things are going to be okay. Because you have no fucking clue. Maybe things will not be okay. Maybe they will die. Maybe somebody else will die. But the thing is like, they feel a certain emotion, right? Can you give them acceptance and compassion of that? Can you be with that emotion? When that happens, magic happens. You know, human beings actually start perceiving things differently just because they are more peaceful with that particular emotion. We don't have to get rid of some emotions in order to feel peaceful. We can be at absolute peace with any emotion, however hard it is. Like we can be crying our hearts out and we can still be deeply at peace with that. So that's that's a different way to, if you will, resolve conflicts. And Dima, if you're ever looking for a new career, I think you'd be a marriage counselor. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> no that's actually you know yeah i'm gonna take some notes away and try to apply them in, in my relationship which is my significant uh, other who's over my case, shoulder <laughs> uh, look up this thing nonviolent communication i don't know if you if you've heard about this and i've heard about this thing for many years and i'm like this is a fucking stupid name nonviolent communication what is it right but then eventually i uh after hearing this as a recommendation from many people, I'm like, okay, let me check it out. And it was a really awesome thing, which uh, made a major impact on relationships and business. So specifically, if you just go to and Google nonviolent communication and the name of the founder escapes me, but he has this wonderful, he has passed away, but there is this wonderful three-hour video summary of his seminar. And it's really teaching people how, instead of trying to convince who has the correct story, how can we be human and connect on a much deeper level, the level of emotion and share our deep emotions and fears and desires and all of that stuff without any attachment to like, you know, you have to behave differently. Well, you know, fuck you, you have to behave differently, right? That's usually how the conflicts go. And uh, what if nobody has to behave differently? What is everybody is, is correct? What is everybody they just have what they have, the behaviors and the emotions, but we as humans can exchange like, okay, this is happening. This is what I want. This is what I'm scared of. And uh, anyways, uh, it's uh, from this foundation, there is a deeper connection can happen and a deeper impact. It's like, uh, to give you one example is for a long time, I lived with her and it's very common. Most humans have a, a story inside of them, but I'm somehow not enough. And the different people, there are different types of this story. Maybe I'm not smart enough. Maybe I'm not successful enough. Maybe I'm blah, blah, blah. In my particular story, like my flavor of the story was like, oh, I'm physically, physically wrong. I'm unlovable. And my mom didn't love me enough and blah, blah, blah. And I carried this story for a long time until I didn't. And in that story, then I was trying to find love from women and like, oh, maybe when I find this ideal person that will give me love, then I will feel differently. No, that's not going to happen, right? Like we can never find an answer to our emotions in any outside of, in any human, in any achievement, in any event, and like governments behaving this way or that way. And when eventually that shift happened in me, and now like... uh I am in this wonderful committed relationship and I'm a male and I can look at a woman and she's beautiful and I can have a desire coming up in me. And in the past, it would be like, oh, what is wrong with me? But I'm in this relationship. What is wrong with my partner? Maybe she's not like loving me enough or not fucking me well enough. All of this stupid bullshit. 
And I was like, yeah, okay. I have this emotion coming up on me. It's not a problem. It's just an emotion. It's here. It came up. It left me. And I'm still here with all of this stuff. And, you know, I have my freedom always. I have my love and peace always. It's not about other people. And I can do anything that I want. I can get into another relationship. I can cheat. And that will have consequences, you know, like it will consequences for myself, for other people in me, right? It's like everything has consequences, right? But the thing is like, again, people try to find love, peace, and freedom somewhere outside. Like, you know, oh, you have to do this for me to feel this love and peace and freedom. It's never found there, but uh, it can be found right now, right here. That's all it takes. It's it's here now. I did not know we go here. <laughs> 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 I needed a crypto expert on the show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but this has been amazing. I'm having an awesome time. I hope you are too, Dima. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, really, I enjoy our conversation. Yeah, I could go all day, honestly, but I don't want to keep you here all day. I'm sure you have better things to do. Uh, there is like one question I do have to ask. Like, uh, Are you in Toronto right now? Yeah. So you have the freedom to be anywhere you want. Am yes. I wrong? So why do you why do you choose Canada? Because I, I ask because there's so much anger out there right now. Like F Trudeau, F America. We're becoming communists, and you actually lived through <laughs> communism. Yeah, yeah. And and I, it's lo- funny because yeah. I sometimes talk to my Russian friends and like, yeah. oh, we're getting back to what the USSR was. Friends who now live in Canada, I'm like, you know what? I look at modern Russia, and you know, in modern Russia, you can write a tweet and be jailed for a few years, oh, and God. then in the jail. They will rape you Fuck. and um, they might kill you. So, no, we're in a different place. But I definitely understand that emotionally it feels like that. Like, how dare they this and that? But the thing is, like, again, it's like uh, we try to attribute how we feel to something outside, right? And like, they should not be doing this. The thing is, like, you know, everything that happens has some very deep reasons for that, right? And, you know, I don't want to get vaccinated. I'm not talking about myself. I am vaccinated, right? But let's say there is a friend and he doesn't want to get vaccinated. I totally respect that, right? Because for whatever it is, he has his reasons, he has his fears. But then he's like, and those people should not be doing this. Well, those people's, uh, people are also humans. They're also fucking scared. They're trying their best to come up with a way to feel safer. We all humans, we hold the same. It's like, you know, when we're able to, see our own humanity and humanity of others so for me canada i think it's a wonderful place and you know my kids are here and they've been sometimes struggling with school over their last couple of years because of all this online education this and that and uh, in general i really not a big fan of organized educations but i have my relatives and friends and kids and uh, and you know what like I found my peace and freedom that's right here, right now. And I truly believe that it's available to any human at any time, right here, right now, independently of any circumstance. And I know it's a huge claim, right? And sometimes I look at, uh, here's this Russian uh, opposition leader, Navalny, that I've been following. I'm a big fan of because I think he has done a lot to show to the world how much corruption is happening in Russia and how bad is the government. So actually... Last summer, the Russian government tried to poison him with chemical weapons. Oh, yeah, I remember raids, that story, right? yeah. And he almost died. And then he was sent to Germany and the, the Germans were able to save him. And then he went back to Russia just because he, he doesn't want to be scared. And they immediately put him into jail. And he's been there now for a year. He's in jail. He's got a wife. He's got daughters. And uh, when I read his messages from jail, that he's able to write on a piece of paper and sometimes, you know, pass uh, through his lawyers, he's free. He's free in jail, right? And uh, that's available to any one of us. And he can die there. He's being mistreated. Like, they do all kinds of stupid shit. Like, you know, the guy who came back to Russia, and then they put him on this, like, uh, watch list of people who are likely to escape. So now they wake him up every hour during the night to check. Are you there? Are you there? Every hour, right? It's a bit of a torture for a human being. He never got like, you know, I think they stopped it recently, but whatever it is. So I'm just saying, he's just another example for me. And there are humans like that everywhere. So all of us, right? Like this is our humanity. This is our humanity 
all of the fears, all of our desire to find an answer, like somebody should be doing things differently. Why should be less lazy? Like, you know, where we blame? No, like, you know, we can be absolutely, absolutely happy, peaceful, full of love and joy right now. Nothing has to happen. It's accessible to us. And yes, we're human with thoughts will come up and emotions and struggle and suffering in us and other humans. That's that. This is it. This is life. Dima, we're, we're well over time and I want to thank you for your time. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. <laughs> yeah. Good talking to you, man. I'm glad we finally did it. 